Hi, my name is Robert Harriman, and I am the editor of the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. And welcome to the inaugural episode of Outbreak News TV. I truly appreciate you watching, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Now, my guest on the first show is a public health scientist, an infectious disease expert, but you may know him best as the director of CIDRAP, the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. He is also the author of this book, really good book, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs, and I encourage you to check that out. My guest today, Michael Osterholm, PhD. Dr. Mike Osterholm, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Good to be with you. Right. Now, thanks for taking the time out of your really busy schedule to talk to me. Um, I'd like to start out the conversation with a little introduction in case there's somebody out there by chance that doesn't know who you are. Um, who is Mike Osterholm and how did you get involved in this infectious disease business? Well, you know, actually, I was very fortunate in that I actually knew that I wanted to be a medical detective way back in fifth grade. It turned out in this little Iowa farm town that I grew up in, there was a woman who subscribed to the uh, New Yorker magazine. I'm sure one of the only people in all of Northeast Iowa. And in that were a series of articles over the years called Annals of Medicine by Burton Roger. And they were really kind of medical whodunit stories, often involving CDC outbreaks and so forth. And uh, she by chance thought that I might have an interest in this because I love the Sherlock Holmes kind of uh, approach. And so I started reading these. And every time she would call and say, I got a new uh, issue and I'm done with it, come and get it, I'd run up there and uh, I would love to read those. And so even when I was in junior high and high school, I had this love of medical detectives and even I could say the word epidemiologist and people often thought I was talking about being a skin doctor, <laughs> uh, when in fact, uh, I, I love this area there. Um, it's ironic that the very last story that Burton Roger did before he died was actually a large outbreak uh, that I was involved with in terms of the outbreak investigation. I led the investigation and it was written up in the annals. And I had an opportunity in that case to actually uh, come full circle with my real mentor, you might say, in this business and explain to him the impact that he'd had on my life. And that uh, I never deviated from those early days of wanting to be a medical detective. Well, in this world of infectious diseases, um, who were your heroes? You mentioned a mentor there, but who are your other heroes, um, whether in literature or people you actually met? You know, I, I have to say that this may not be a satisfactory answer, but I'm surrounded every day by my heroes. Um, you know, I work with a team of people today at SIDRAP who the leadership team has now all been together for 34 years or more. They were with me at the Minnesota Department of Health, came with me to the university. Um, you know, we built an incredible team here in Minnesota and they are there day in and day out. And frankly, if I had to say my number one heroes are my uh, colleagues at SIDRAP who really make it possible to do what we do. Uh, you know, I often get credit for things that they are fully responsible for doing, not me. And uh, that's my number one heroes. I think the second set of heroes I have to say though, is I've been wonderfully gifted to have worked with a number of national experts who took their time and effort with me to help me along. Dr. Ed Cass, who was a very famous infectious disease physician in the 1970s and 80s, uh, ran into me during the world of toxic shock syndrome. I was a 26 year old you know, neophyte epidemiologist and nominated me into the Infectious Disease Society of America as a fellow uh, and uh, made it possible for me to really go into that world. Um, Josh Lutterberg, who was a giant in the area of infectious diseases, chaired a number of National Academy of Medicine, Institute of Medicine reports, uh, a, a consultant to the world in infectious diseases, same thing. I got to know Josh early in my career through work at the National Academy of Medicine, and uh, it was an incredible relationship. And then I've had a number of mentors right here in Minnesota, teachers who, uh, when I first started graduate school uh, in 1975, I was going to school full-time and working full-time at the Minnesota Department of Health. And uh, there were probably a number of times when I should have been focusing much more on my studies than I were, and, and or I was. And so uh, these professors would be very kind in reminding me of what my primary duty was to get through graduate school 
uh, even though I might be up to my eyeballs in these outbreaks that the Department of Health were doing studies. And so, you know, I, I've been blessed to have had many, many, many heroes in my business, but without a doubt, my, the team at SIDRAP are, are at the top of my list. I'm sure they'll be glad to hear that. Um, now, there's something I'd like to share with the audience. I hope I hope you would uh, 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 give, give us this uh, fantastic story. Um, when you were an epidemiologist at the Minnesota DOH, uh, uh, you were given the name Bad News Mike. So what is the story behind Bad News Mike? Well, you know, I think that uh, that line, which uh, was actually in a, uh, a magazine article about me, really reflected more uh, about the business we're in than it really was me. I mean, today, whether you're at the CDC or uh, at a state or local health department, oftentimes the outbreaks that we have to deal with or the disease problems that are emerging means that it's not good news. And oftentimes we're the bearer of that bad news. You know, throughout my career, uh, I've been fortunate in having been involved with a lot of, of uh, outbreaks or disease problems of international importance. Um, and I uh, you know, highlighted in the book that I published a year ago on this topic. And uh, a, a for example was uh, back in 1984 when then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Margaret Heckler, and uh, one of the leading uh, retrovirologists of the world had a press conference in which they said we'd have an HIV vaccine in three years. That was 1984. I was quoted in the media in the following days saying, well, that's just not going to happen. I don't think we'll have an effective HIV vaccine in my lifetime. And for the reasons that I knew about the challenges of trying to develop immunity against the transmission of retroviruses. And, you know, I said, if we have a new beam me up Scotty machine, maybe that'll happen. <laughs> well, I sit here now in 2019 and I repeat that mantra. You know, I don't think we'll have an effective HIV vaccine in my lifetime. Now, that was really bad news in 1984, and it wasn't said at that time to be so negative as a fact that I was trying to be negative. It was trying to help us say we had to deal with HIV AIDS without the ability to have an effective vaccine, and we needed to get serious about the kinds of programs that we would develop on a behavior basis that could help limit uh, HIV transmission, of course, the drug program surely helped too. So I think in a lot of cases, bad news means that you're bringing forward something you don't want to hear. You know, we're still ill-prepared for pandemic influenza, although we're making some inroads. Antibiotic resistance today is a huge issue that will be a legacy issue for our grandkids and, and their kids. Um, those are all bad news, but it's not about me or it's not about anyone individual. It's just helping the public understand what they need to do. And, I would leave you with one last uh, thought. My, I always believe my approach in this world and my job was not to scare people out of their wits, but to scare them into their wits. And I think <laughs> from that perspective, that's what I try very hard to do is scare people into their wits, not out of their wits. Well, you've been, you've been an epidemiologist for a long time. Um, can you share with us some of your most, more memorable investigations? You know, I think that they are both uh, you might say uh, the impact of the outbreak or the investigation, but also the individual stories. For example, in 1980, when we were working on toxic shock syndrome here in our group was very involved in the early recognition of the problem and then uncovering the actual mechanism of the absorbency of the tampon and the fact that the release of oxygen in the vagina is what drove the toxin production uh, uh, in the Staph aureus bacteria. It wasn't one single brand of tampon that has been reported initially by the CDC. You know, that was pretty heady stuff to be involved with back in, in 1980 at a young age. But what I remember most is being at the bedside of a young girl as she died from toxic shock syndrome, having gained well over 75 to 80 pounds of fluid because of the third spacing problems that were happening with her shock. You never forget those cases. And I think that uh, to me, watching children die still is the most horrible thing that anyone can be involved with in these outbreaks. Well, well, you've had a, a number of very unique roles, uh, interesting roles over the years. And I'd like to ask you about a few of them. And uh, one is some of your roles with the Department of HHS. Um, what were they and what did they entail? Well, I've been a consultant to the last five presidential administrations on one aspect or another of public health. And uh, I must say during that time, you know, it was never a partisan issue. I'm just a private in the public health army that we all, in us, you know, those of us in public health are part of. And my job is to do the best job I can for whoever's there. 
So uh, I would have to say that, you know, I've had a number of roles. The role, though, that was without a doubt the most important and memorable to me was right after 9-11, uh, Secretary Tommy Thompson, then at HHS, former governor of Wisconsin, asked me if I would come and serve as an advisor to him. I had just started full time at the university, having left the health department and and uh, my part time there, part time at the U and was at the U full time. Um, I agreed to do that. Uh, I said, you know, clearly that, uh, you know, I had certain points of view. I understood the need for the administration to have their points of view that as long as I could serve and be, uh, you know, the person that I am scientifically, you know, with scientific integrity, I'd stay. Well, it was a most wonderful experience with Secretary Thompson. Um, he had surrounded himself with a group of excellent people. Uh, one today who is still a very, very dear friend and colleague, Stuart Simonson, who is the, one of the associate directors of the WHO today, one of the most capable and competent professionals I've ever worked with. And then along with me, Secretary Thompson brought in D.A. Henderson, from Johns Hopkins, uh, also a well-known figure, Dr. Phil Russell, uh, who, former head of USAMRID, a very well-known figure, uh, Dr. Bill Robb, former associate director of the NIH, and a group like that that really were remarkable professionals. Together with that, Dr. Julie Gerberding, who was at CDC, and Dr. Tony Fauci at NIH, we made a formidable team in terms of the science and the ability to impact policy. So I, I have to say that was a remarkable experience. Um, I found that the ability to work with these kinds of professionals within the policy world uh, was a gift. And uh, i sure I learned much, much more and received much more out of those experiences than I ever gave back. And you, and you also did some work with the late King Hussein of Jordan. What, what right. were you doing there? Well, um, in the late 1980s, with the collapse of the former Soviet Union, uh, there was obviously a, a revelation about the world of bioterrorism that the Russians had been working on. At Novosibirsk at one time, there were many thousands of PhD level people working on the development of bioweapons. And with the fall of the wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, a number of these individuals came to our attention, came to the West, and I was actually involved in some of the debriefings and, and work with that. So I got very involved with bioterrorism. But at the same time, um, through a series of contacts, King Hussein of Jordan became aware of my work uh, in this area and actually requested uh, to meet with me, which I did. Uh, and over a period of time, uh, got to know him quite well um, and his family. And as a result of that, uh, I often uh, would provide intelligence information, you might say, on, uh, from the infectious disease world, not the spy world, uh, about what was going on. And he uh, wanted that. The most memorable meeting I probably ever had in my career occurred uh, in early February of, of, of the year that he died, uh, which was in 1999. And uh, I was on my way to work that day at the Minnesota Department of Health. We had an outbreak of uh, Neisseria meningitis infection in college students in Duluth, Minnesota. I was on my way to go to Duluth. Next thing I know, I get a call from the Jordanian Embassy telling me that, the, uh, that His Majesty wanted to meet with me right away, which usually meant, okay, several weeks, uh, we get something mm -hmm. set up. And they met right away. Uh, he was at that time at his estate in Ascot outside of London. And they already had bought a ticket for me, had made everything, all the arrangements. I literally went to London in the clothes I went to work in at the Minnesota Department of Health that day. I got to Heathrow late uh, or early the next morning, and uh, they uh, picked me up at the airport, drove me to the estate, and I was escorted right away to the main house. Normally, it would have gone to a guest house and, you know, freshened up, slept, met later that day at the earliest. And I met with him in his bathrobe. Uh, in the Temple Mount room, which is where the beautiful painting of the Temple Mount is. And uh, he, along with the head of GID, the Jordanian uh, uh, intelligence agency, sat there and grilled me for several hours on smallpox. Um, uh, in the process, Queen Nord came in and out several times. And, uh, and then, lo and behold, uh, we're done. Um, I have lunch with them, go back to uh, my place, and I'm back in Minnesota the next day. Well, several weeks later, His Majesty wrote a very famous letter, which dismissed his brother as the regent or the heir apparent. And in that process, he then appointed his son to be the regent. That was the first part of the letter, a small part of it. What was really uh, significant was he then went on and elaborated on the fact that he worried 
very, very much, uh, not so much about war, but the power of bioterrorism and the use of biologic weapons. And then he went into some detail on smallpox. Um, I had to believe he knew something about smallpox that the rest of us didn't. He was at the main intersection of so much intelligence information from so many different sources. And then unfortunately, he died suddenly three weeks later. And uh, and to this day, I still don't know what he knew or didn't know. And, and I don't know if anyone else does. But uh, those that was a very memorable day for me. I will never forget that for as long as I live. That's an amazing story. Uh, Dr. Osterholm, you started SIDRAP at the University of Minnesota, I don't know, a couple decades ago, right? Actually, uh, 2001. Ironically, we opened the door a week before 9-11. Okay. <laughs> that is ironic. Um, what was the genesis of SIDRAP? You know, and in, in addition to the new site, which I'm sure most viewers are quite familiar with, um, what else does SIDRAP do? Well, SIDRAP, first of all, stands for the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. And I, throughout my career, often understood the fact that uh, we had some real challenges with trying to do public health interventions because we either had good science or bad science or no science, or we had little to no policy or effective policy. And to me, they're kind of like chocolate and peanut butter. You know, the two of them together are great, but separately, you know, they're, they're okay. Today, I can tell you that policy that is ill-informed because of bad science or no science can be dangerous policy. Science, no matter how good it is, if it's not put into place into policy, it doesn't make an impact. What good does it do except maybe make for a great publication? And so SIDRAP was really an attempt to bring together science and policy. And we're very involved in a lot of these issues. For example, uh, right now we're developing the R&D roadmap for WHO and the world on uh, game changing or universal flu vaccines. Uh, we've been very actively involved with that same effort for WHO uh, on Ebola, Lhasa and Nipah vaccines. Uh, we have today the single number one presence in the world on information for antibiotic stewardship. If you go to our website, it's a massive effort mm -hmm. to provide current, comprehensive, and authoritative information on antibiotic stewardship so we can hopefully slow down uh, the overuse of antibiotics and causing more resistance to develop. Um, I could go through a laundry list of things. We're very involved today looking at chronic wasting disease issues. Uh, mm -hmm. I, for one, am very, very concerned that what we're seeing today with cervids, white-tailed deer and elk in the United States, uh, which is now in, in 26 states, that we're going to see another repeat of BSE at variant Kreuzfeldt Jakob that we saw in Great Britain in 1986 into the 2000 time period. Uh, so we get involved in a lot of these kinds of issues uh, and uh, moving forward. And it to us is really a natural to take this, you might say, hardcore science agenda, but also then merge it with the policy to make sure that we make a difference. Our work with influenza vaccines, an example, uh, when I published my first papers in 2005, indicating we had real challenges with our current flu vaccines. Um, that was not a popular issue. When we published a very well-known paper in Lancet in 2011, stating that we had grossly overstated how well flu vaccines work, not intentionally, we didn't understand uh, that the way we were measuring their, their outcome or protection was not accurate. Uh, today, those have all changed. Today, we have a world uh, scientifically, it's come together that is actively working on new flu vaccines. They understand that the ones we have are the best tools we have. They should be used. They're very important. We need new and better vaccines. And so our group is really involved with helping make things like that happen. Well, uh, Dr. Osterholm, let's go ahead and switch gears to some present and future issues. And probably the biggest thing in the news these days is, other than Ebola, is the vaccine preventable diseases issues popping up all over the globe, the U.S. included. Um, we're seeing it in Europe. We've seen it in the Philippines now. Um, and of course, uh, measles and diphtheria down in South America. And to me, that this demonstrates public health harm in at least two ways. Uh, the growth of the anti-vaccine movement and uh, the collapse of government in the case of Venezuela. And I was hoping you could address each of these issues, uh, starting with the anti-vaccine movement and the harm that it's causing. And is there an answer to this? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for that question. It's a great question. And I think you nailed it exactly in terms of what the two major drivers are. It really is about vaccine hesitancy and it's about the failed state status. Um, 
If you look at vaccine hesitancy, uh, I'm really very, very pleased the WHO just listed this as one of the top 10 issues public health-wise confronting the world today. It is. Uh, you know, we can be so, so smart in terms of what we think we know, and yet as a society, we can be so dumb. And what I mean by that is, is that we don't take the kind of information that is well, well versed in science, that is data that are that I would say are without refute, meaning that, uh, you know, it's like gravity. You can argue with it, but it's going to win every time. We know a lot about the safety and the effectiveness of our vaccines. We know that they work and we can tell you what happens if they're not used. Despite that today, in this world of vaccine hesitancy, where it's almost like the fake news issue, you can make up whatever fact you want, we're seeing a growing number of people who challenge the establishment. They challenge governments. They challenge medical organizations. And that's part of a, a bigger social cultural issue far beyond that just of vaccines. But it's causing us real harm because, in fact, part of the protection of a vaccine program is the more people you get vaccinated, the more rods you put in the reaction so that it doesn't take off. And just as you so uh, very clearly laid out, we're seeing this globally. It's not just the United States, it's Europe. The measles outbreak problems in Europe right now are unprecedented in, in modern time. Uh, what we're seeing here in the United States is just an ongoing day after day issue. And it's, as you pointed out, it's not one vaccine. So we need to continue to do everything we can to promote uh, vaccination, knowing that we don't have all the answers. It used to be just education was enough. If you, had, if you educated people, they would in fact do the right thing. That's not the case today. We have to understand more what to do. The second thing which you noted is a failed state status. And, you know, when you look at it today, think about this fact. Back in the 1960s, when the Soviet Union and the United States got together and decided to eradicate smallpox, that was a monumental decision. And people often think that the reason we eradicated smallpox was because, first of all, it's a human disease only. We didn't have an animal reservoir. Second of all, we had a vaccine that even if given uh, uh, several days after exposure, it could still prevent infection. And most of all, we had cases that clearly were smallpox. You didn't have to wonder if this person had smallpox. And so from that standpoint, you'd think the science was really the dominating factor why we were successful. And in fact, that wasn't the case at all. It was because back then in the 1960s and early 70s, every country in the world was a domino behind either the Soviet Union or the United States. And when that first domino went over, everybody got in line and did exactly what uh, the two major countries had, had indicated to do. Today, we don't have that. Who's in charge of the world today? Which country or countries really dominate? And so we don't have a global standard today for public health practice that's adopted by and accepted by all the countries of the world. And so this is a real challenge. On top of that, you add the failed state status. You mentioned earlier Venezuela. You look at that. That is probably the single greatest tragedy in modern public health. Most people don't realize the fact that Venezuela was the first country in the world. Let me repeat that. The first country in the world in the 1960s to eradicate malaria out of its populous regions. Isn't that amazing? That is. And look what happened with the breakdown and the economy, the government, and so forth. Today, it has the largest urbanized malaria problem we've ever seen. Yep. Yep. And so to go from one extreme to the other points out just the vulnerability of us to, to the world today with failed state status. And we can see that look at how hard it is right now to extinguish Ebola in parts of the DRC. Now, other parts of the DRC, we got it done because of the fact that there was uh, a certain social justice system in place that and a certain law enforcement in place that allowed for orderly work to be done. We have a huge problem today in the northeastern part of, of DRC. Uh, look at places like Yemen and Syria. You know, the world's largest outbreak of cholera has just happened in Yemen because of what is going on with the war there and the tragedy of that, you know, using uh, children, women and children as part of the, the war field, the, the battlefield, that's crazy. And yet we have this. So, so we do have challenges today that we just have to acknowledge are so different than we've had before. And that, uh, uh, as you so well said, again, vaccine hesitancy and failed state status are major challenges for us. Yeah. Um, so I want to look at a more positive note now. You know, what do you, what do you see as the greatest successes in the fight against infectious diseases? 
I'm assuming well, vaccine is going to be one of them. Vaccines are going to be one of them. And I, I, I have to tell you my dream, if I had a dream <laughs> before I get carted off the playing field here uh, in my work, is I have this dream that we're going to come up with a game changing or what some people call universal flu vaccine that could be given once every 10 years or so that would cover a variety of strains of influenza, including new emerging ones that might very well be the pandemic of tomorrow. And that we have the not only ability to develop these vaccines and make them available, but the world makes us a priority like it did smallpox. Imagine if we vaccinated the world or a large part of it against flu in such a way that we could take pandemic influenza off the map because we have enough reactors in, or rods in the reaction to stop it. We would also have a big impact in seasonal flu. This should not be seen as implausible. This should not be seen as impossible. This is truly a potential opportunity for public health to shine as much as it ever did with smallpox. And so I, I'm very optimistic about that. Um, I'm optimistic about the future in the sense of my students. I, I have some amazing students today that, frankly, are a hell of a lot smarter than me. And mm -hmm. they have fire in their belly and they see the problems. They realize my generation is handed to them a mess, a mess. And so I'm optimistic about that, too. And, uh, you know, human ingenuity has to beat the evolutionary uh, success of microbes. And while we'll always be challenged, I think we still have a few successes up our sleeves that it just takes the ability to dream, the ability to plan, and the ability to execute. And yeah. if we can yeah. do that, I think we're, we can make a big difference. Well, um, earlier you mentioned the uh, World Health Organization 10 threats to global health in 2019. And I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. And what are your biggest infectious disease and health concerns, other than what they've already reported, um, for 2019 and beyond? Well, you know, I think the longest journey starts with the first steps, okay? Uh, so let me just start in what may not be the highlight of the 19, but it's fully here. You know, pandemic influenza still has to be the case. I mean, it, today the, the avian population of the world is so different where we have at any one time 25 billion chickens on the face of the earth, more chickens than all the other bird species combined. Think of that and it's to feed the world, the protein. Well, with that, we have created this incredible manufacturing plant for influenza viruses that could cause the next pandemic. So we have to be prepared for that. This could be huge. I think, so influenza will stay in my number one threat to the world. The second one though is antimicrobial resistance. It is no longer creeping along. It is running along. And we see day after day after day, new challenges. We see a, a pipeline that is so thin and fragile of new antibiotics that uh, it, it's not something that even at this point is, is likely to have much of a dent in what's happening with the antimicrobial resistance. Our best hope is slowing it down with a much more expeditious use of antibiotics, what we talked about earlier, antibiotic stewardship. But think about this. Our grandparents grew up in a pre-antibiotic era. My great-grandchildren are likely going to grow up in a post-antibiotic era. That's, That's a pretty damn scary idea. Yeah. And yeah. so when you look at that, uh, the AMR report, uh, antimicrobial resistance report put out by Sir Jim O'Neill and colleagues from, from Great Britain two years ago, actually did some very detailed modeling. And I tend to be one who's not a big fan of a lot of modeling because it surely stretches the science far beyond its just dessert. Um, but in this case, they did really, a, a, I think, a very reasonable, solid job. And they project by 2050 that there will be more people dying from antimicrobial resistant infections, meaning it's because it was antibiotic resistant, than both diabetes and, uh, and uh, cancer combined. Think about that. That's pretty amazing. And so that I think at this point we have to understand that uh, the challenges are huge, but we don't have a choice. Growing up in a post-antibiotic era is not an acceptable uh, outcome. We have to figure out what we're going to do about it. How about uh, vector-borne diseases? I mean, there's, there's, you know, we went, we went through uh, chikungunya, we went through Zika. There's other things stirring yeah. around down in South America. What's your concern there? Well, you know, again, one of the most disheartening things uh, that I talk about in my class, where maybe bad news might come through, mm -hmm. is a map that I show of what the distribution of Aedes aegypti was in the Americas back in the 1940s and 50s. And then I show what it was like in the 1970s and then today. 
when PAHO, the American Health Organization, and the Rockefeller Foundation got together in the 40s and 50s and literally went block by block in the Americas, eliminating the breeding sites for Aedes aegypti, the vector of yellow fever, dengue, uh, chikungunya, uh, uh, Zika, etc. And they really did a remarkable job, such by the 1970s, there were very few places left in the Americas that had Aedes aegypti, and where they did have it, it was very low levels. Go look at that same map today. It is much more widespread than it was in the 1940s, and the population levels are much higher. Why in part? Well, because we gave up in the 1970s. In fact, when I was going into infectious diseases in the 1970s, people would say to me, why are you going into that horse and buggy stuff? You know, this is done. You know, go into the serious diseases like heart and, you know, that. And um, what people didn't realize is two things happened. One is we stopped really being concerned about vector-borne diseases. The major programs, the medical entomology programs we had throughout the world literally disintegrated in two, gen in two decades. But more importantly, remember the old movie, The Graduate? And when Benjamin was at a pool party one day, everybody was giving him advice what to go into. And the one that came out loud and clear was plastics. And what's happened is we have created a world of plastics today that not only are environmentally very, very challenging, but today if you want to grow Aedes aegypti, just have all the discarded plastic garbage of the world that we have, particularly in the low and middle income countries, and look at the number of breeding sites that have just skyrocketed because of this. You know, one bottle cap literally in a ditch with water is capable of becoming a bioreactor for mosquitoes. Uh, and so one of the things we have to deal with today is that the environment is much greater. So you're absolutely right. Vector-borne diseases are huge when it is aegypti. Same thing is true. We've made inroads recently with malaria and Anopheles mosquitoes. Yeah. But at the yeah. same time, we're starting to see uh, that falling back and we're beginning to see resistance. We are never done, never done with vector-borne diseases. The final piece I would just say is I think climate change is going to have a big impact in vector-borne diseases, both in terms of this distribution of mosquitoes as well as ticks. Ticks are going to also be affected. So uh, I think we are still a long ways away from writing the history of vector-borne diseases based on the impact of climate change. Yeah. Yeah. One last question, Dr. Osterholm, and I want to get your thoughts on uh, uh, the, the issue with the pol wild polio virus and, and the vaccine derived polio virus. Uh, it's I mean, the the ground made has been astounding. However, it seems like we're hitting a speed bump. Well, I'd say it's more than maybe a speed bump. I think that what we've hit is reality. And that's a challenge because, in fact, that we keep getting close and getting close, but then we have places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, go through the countries that have just seen challenges. Uh, we talked about failed state status. I give great, great credit to the polio eradicators that have worked tirelessly, the number who have been killed in action. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I think we have to understand that we may always be living in a world where they're never, it's never quite gone. Now, that's still a hell of a lot easier to deal with that and cheaper than dealing with a world where polio comes back, both mm -hmm. the physical cost, but also the economic cost. But I think we have to start preparing ourselves. Look at measles. We had so many successes. There was a certain kind of giddiness in the public health community 10 to 15 years ago about the number of places that had been mis you know, measles free for, for years. And then all of a sudden to come back with a vengeance. I think with vaccine preventable diseases like this, we're going to always have to be vigilant. And I, I can continue to say we got to keep polio at bay. Ideally, we'd eradicate it. But if we can't, we got to keep hard at it, because if we don't tomorrow, we'll pay a hell of a price. Yeah, I, I recently read a before um, I had a print uh, article in EID, uh, again, about Venezuela and uh, yeah. The vaccination rates down there for polio are just abysmal. So there's a lot of concern about that resurging. Well, you know, and it's all the vaccine preventable diseases there. And that is a seeding source for all the countries around there because people don't stay. In fact, people are trying to leave Venezuela. Yeah. And, and so that's one of the challenges. It's kind of like having an abscess somewhere deep in your body that keeps throwing out uh, clots of bugs. Until you get that thing out, you're going to always have a problem. And so uh, until we can go into countries like Venezuela, stabilize the health system, uh, get people vaccinated, we're going to have this terrible, terrible problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate the conversation and the great stories. And I want to thank you, 
Dr. Mike Osterholm for spending some time with us. And Robert, thank show. you. And thank you for all you do yourself. You you have been an amazing force <laughs> to educate the world in infectious disease actions. Uh, your surveillance activity of information is second to none. Uh, you do a great job. And so I know at SIDRAP, we uh, follow you carefully and uh, are, are uh, really very fortunate to benefit from so much of your contribution. So thank oh, you. I humbly uh, appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Have a great yeah. night. See you later. And don't forget to check us out at the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, the podcast, Outbreak News Interviews, which can be found on the website, on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and Spotify, and the Outbreak News This Week radio show, which is aired Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time in the Tampa Bay area on AM 1380 The Biz, or online streaming at 1380thebiz.com. And check out our social media presence, Facebook at Infectious Disease News, and Twitter, at BackDman63. Outbreak News TV is a production of The Global Dispatch. Copyright, The Global Dispatch, Incorporated, 2019.